If you ask a kid what their favorite food is, you'll likely get a lot of different answers. Pizza is always a favorite, along with other kids' meal classics like chicken nuggets and macaroni and cheese. What would notably be missing from this list, however, is raw chicken patties, soggy vegetables, and mystery meat. So why are these foods some of the core staples of American school lunches served to kids for all but three months out of the year? School lunches have infamously been a hot topic of debate pretty much since their inception in the early 1940s. They've evolved from being created to feed starving children during the Great Depression to now serving as part of the reason childhood obesity is on the rise, or, at the same time, why some kids are skipping lunch altogether. The main point in question is typically the quality of the food that's served, although there are a ton of other issues to be had with school cafeterias and what children are or aren't getting out of them. I've always found it interesting that in media like movies and TV, American school cafeterias often have this certain collection of stereotypes to them. Lunch ladies are often depicted as being old or ugly, mean or apathetic, or sometimes even dirty and violating school health codes. The food that they serve often complements their depictions with mystery meat and indiscernible slop being among the most common tropes. I think that this speaks a point about how people view American school cafeteria meals. Of course, inedible and mysterious food would only be cooked by mean, ugly lunch ladies. And it seems a lot of people in film and TV also just have a negative memory of their school cafeterias in general, which would explain why it's still being portrayed with these same tropes to this day. But is school cafeteria food really that bad? I was in public school between 2004 to 2017, which was an interesting time for the development of school lunches. I almost always bought my lunch in the cafeteria too, so my experiences are based on going through the lunch line for 13 years instead of bringing food from home. When I was in elementary school, I remember actually really liking the cafeteria food. I've always been a picky eater, so there were, of course, some things I just wouldn't touch, but what I did buy never really gave me anything to complain about. Some of my favorite school lunches were chicken nuggets, hot dogs, and of course the iconic rectangle cafeteria pizza. The lunch ladies were always really sweet, too. My school lunch lines at the schools I attended were double-sided, meaning that kids could slide along either side and all the food was self-serve. That's to say that I never had a lunch lady scooping something onto my tray for me, but even if I did, I'm sure they would have been really nice about it. As I got older though, I started to recognize that not all of the food that was served was top quality. Burger or sandwich buns were usually pretty dry and the patties that were in them weren't typically any better. Fruits and vegetables were often pretty soggy or limp looking and the milk cartons at the front of the lunch line slowly became less appetizing over time. I actually remember when they replaced the pet brand milk for Trumu when I was around 11, with Trumu still being the milk brand used in my school district to this day. This new milk, or the chocolate milk specifically, always had this pile of unmixed chocolate flavoring at the bottom of the carton. You could try shaking the milk before you opened it, but it usually didn't help much. So with this chocolatey sludge in the milk cartons in mind, you can get an idea of the quality of the watered down milk that was being served with lunch. By high school, I had a pretty good understanding of what foods were decent in the lunch line and what definitely weren't. Thankfully, I never had any terribly disgusting experiences, but when searching online, it's clear that a lot of other kids across the country did. Bruised or rotten fruit, moldy packaged items, and undercooked meat are just some of the travesties that appear in American school cafeterias. I never understood the stereotype of mystery meat in media depictions of lunch lines. I knew not everything was up to everyone's standard, but I personally never saw something that could be ridiculed to the level of being unrecognizable as something edible. I even planned to kind of poke fun at it in this video until I found pictures that pretty quickly proved that this wasn't just some exaggerated joke. Sometimes it really is impossible to tell what the lunch line is offering, especially if it's a line without labels near the food to solve the mystery of the mystery meat. To add insult to injury, if these meals were being properly cooked or checked for bruises and mold before being offered to children, the poor quality still isn't exactly absolved. A report in 2009 by USA Today found that the safety standards of the Agricultural Marketing Service, or AMS, a part of the U.S. Department of Agriculture that buys meat for school lunches, 
were lower than the standards of the average fast food restaurant in the country. That means that meat like chicken that was turned away by the likes of KFC and the Campbell Soup Company ended up in the lunch lines of American schools and being fed to children. The study blames poor quality control and lack of testing of meat samples for so much meat containing bacteria and potential pathogens slipping through into school cafeterias. Despite school lunches not exactly being what you'd call top quality at my schools and plenty of others, there was still always something in the lunch line that would sweeten the deal. I'm of course talking about the cafeteria desserts. I remember my elementary school lunch line, which wasn't overly long, having a whole section of the line dedicated to sweets that took up about a quarter of the whole line. They were things like cake, cookies, pudding, jello, and of course, ice cream. If your school cafeteria didn't have a freezer built into the lunch line, then you were missing out. My school had push pops, Minute Maid freeze bars, those little ice cream cups with the wooden spoons, fudgesicles, creamsicles, popsicles. Basically, if it was frozen, sweet, and ended in sickle, then it was probably stocked in the lunch line freezer. And my schools had kids pay for their lunch using a lunch number or student number that was unique to each kid. It was easier for some parents to just load up the lunch fund by making a check out to the school than to give their children cash each day. The problem with this, though, was that all I had to do was type in my lunch number or tell it to the lunch lady, and then I could buy whatever I wanted, desserts included. And as a kid with a huge sweet tooth, I don't think that was an ideal setup for creating a healthy relationship with food. And I am definitely sure I wasn't the only kid that would buy a little plastic bag of cookies or a cafeteria cake at the end of the lunch line just because I could. The kids that did bring cash in hand to school weren't exempt from this either. I'm sure it was just as easy to budget in a fudgesicle from the freezer with the couple of bucks you had in your pocket by not buying milk to drink or getting less proper food to eat. In middle and high school, it wasn't much better. Middle school introduced warm, soft cookies in a special paper bag that had three cookies in it for a dollar. That's a better deal than Subway. The cookies were made by Otis Spunkmeyer, as it said on their paper bag, and were the exact kind of greasy goodness you would expect from an arcade snack bar or something, but not ideally from a children's lunchroom. I continued to be tempted very easily by all the desserts that were always in my daily and immediate reach, except now I was being advertised to by contract deals made through the school. I don't think I need to explain why including sugary foods in the cafeteria isn't a great idea, but I will anyway. Snacks and junk food are typically treated as sometimes foods in most households, with many parents limiting their children's intake of sugar and fats when they can. But of course, school is the one place that parents are away from their kids. With teachers and the lunchroom staff being mostly uninvolved in a children's meal decisions, kids are given free reign to have whatever they want. With obesity, especially childhood obesity, and diabetes becoming more and more prevalent as American health issues, I just wonder whose idea it was exactly to start incorporating desserts into the lunch line. Surely, back in the 40s during the Great Depression era, the school lunch program wasn't spending what little money was around at the time on things like cakes and pies to give to children. So at what point did the capitalists realize that getting children hooked on sugar, in the place they spend the majority of their formative years in, was a good idea? My persistent sweet tooth and I would like to have a word with them, whoever they are. Even if sweets weren't available in the lunch line, there are still some issues with the way that kids are eating at school. One of my favorite foods that my elementary school cafeteria offered was mashed potatoes. I always liked mashed potatoes, but there was something about the taste of the kind I could only get in my cafeteria that made me feel like I could not get enough. The styrofoam trays that we piled our food onto and the lunch line had these divided sections in different sizes that were meant for different foods. The large portion for the main meal, the smaller sections off to the side for your fruit, vegetables, or probably a dessert, and the square in the middle shaped to specially hold a carton of milk. Whenever mashed potatoes were available, I would pile as much as I could into these tiny side sections of my tray, but it was never enough. So since they weren't technically labeled and no one was around to really tell me otherwise, I realized one day that I could get more mashed potatoes if I put them in the biggest slot on my tray. I definitely got some weird looks and comments from other kids for doing this, but seeing as that was the extent of the negative attention I received, I continued to do it every time mashed potatoes were served until I started caring more about what people think and realized I should probably chill out with the mashed potatoes obsession. 
I've always thought this story was kind of funny, and I still do, but I also think that it alludes to another issue with school lunches that isn't often as talked about as the access to sugar. Despite there being loose recommendations and posters of things like healthy eating guides or the food pyramid around, most children, in my experience, were free to get whatever they wanted and however much of it they liked. With the lunch ladies working to keep the food prepped and stocked while also completing transactions at their registers, there was likely little time or, frankly, effort to be policing hungry kids on what they could and couldn't buy. And so, lunch rooms would end up with trays like this. Or like mine with a mountain of mashed potatoes. At least I didn't like it with gravy, that must count for something. Like I mentioned before, school lunches have always been a touchy subject for parents, school boards, and politicians alike. One of the more recent and notable changes made to the school lunch program, though, happened while I was in school and with changes I actually noticed and experienced. Michelle Obama, former first lady of the US, was outspoken about wanting to do something to remedy childhood obesity, which led to the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act of 2010. This was a national movement that changed nutrition standards with the school lunch program by requiring more healthy foods to be served. There was a regulation to offer more fruits, vegetables, and whole grains, limitations to serve fat-free or low-fat milk options only, and a reduction of sodium and trans fats within foods served, among other changes. I don't think that I recognized these new requirements as they were made in my school right away, but soon enough they were pretty hard to ignore. One of the most notable changes I tuned into was that now, the lunch staff that were already likely overworked and underpaid now were in charge of policing kids and the food they were buying at lunch. I've always been a picky eater, but it wasn't usually much of a problem in the school cafeteria. If I didn't want green beans, then I could leave them off my tray and just not eat them. But with the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act, which I'm going to refer to as the Obamification of school lunches for short, Leaving a vegetable off of my plate, if I didn't want it, was no longer allowed. I remember the day that a lunch lady wouldn't let me buy my food before I had at least one fruit or vegetable on my tray. I was confused and just did what she said, but I was pretty put off by it. I understand why this seems like a good idea, but obviously, if a kid doesn't want to eat something, forcing them to buy it isn't going to suddenly make it appetizing. I would usually pick up an apple or orange, something easy, but without a taste for bruised or weeks old fruit, I'd usually just end up tossing whatever fruit or vegetable I had been required to buy in the trash. I also remember the introduction of more whole grains into our lunches, which as far as I can recall mostly just meant the replacement of refined grain hamburger buns and dinner rolls with whole grain versions. My family only ever had white bread at home, and I didn't know a ton of people who were any different. Whole grains aren't the worst thing in the world, but they definitely don't taste as nice as other options, so this change didn't make a lot of people happy either. It might seem a little entitled, but downgrading a meal that already only consisted of chalky milk, soggy fruit, and a dried out hamburger just made some kids a little bit frustrated. With that being said, childhood obesity is still a big problem not only in America, but around the world. School lunches and the Obamification of them was definitely coming from a good place, but seemed to not fully reach some of the bigger issues within the system. Whole grains can only do so much good while they're part of a meal of a burger and tater tots. Required fruits and vegetables aren't nearly as healthy when they're covered in cheese, gravy, or mixed with jello. And meal options like cheese dippers, basically another name for cafeteria mozzarella sticks, corn dogs, pizza, and of course desserts were still prevalent during the reign of Obamification. In my elementary school, sheet pan cafeteria pizza was a fan favorite. In middle school, my cafeteria offered what I assume was more contracted food through Red Baron Pizza that also came in their own specially branded containers. And in high school, and what I think is worst of all, every school year for each of the four years that I attended, Little Caesars Pizza was offered in the lunch line every day without fail. If you've ever wondered what America's obsession with pizza comes from, you should probably look to the school lunch rooms. So much pizza and other junk food being offered as meals was a problem mostly overlooked or at least overshadowed by Obamification, so was any actual progress being made? Speaking of contracted food, this poses another issue to the health of school children, and this time it doesn't necessarily come from the school lunch program directly or the hands of school lunch staff. 
School districts across the country frequently enter exclusive contracts with corporations like Pepsi and Coca-Cola, among other vendors and food providers, in exchange for direct payments to support school funding needs. These contracts can include conditions like prominent display of advertising and marketing on school campuses, and incentive payments for increasing the sales of their products at schools and school events. It's estimated that $12 billion per year is spent on junk food advertising to school children, which, yeah, I'd say is a bit of a bigger issue than a cake or two in the lunch line. Introducing advertising and product loyalty to impressionable children can have way more potent and long-lasting effects on their overall health and well-being. Some states and school districts have created policies to ban these kinds of exclusive contracts and advertising to children, but the majority, like all of the schools I went to, didn't get the same treatment. So you can see why some people have a negative view of Obamification of school lunches for one reason or another. Michelle Obama's move to help children lead healthy lifestyles was definitely a nice thought and on the right track for sure, but kids were, and are, still eating junk food for lunch, except now they're required to get a fruit or vegetable that they likely won't even eat and just end up wasting in the trash. This food waste has even more negative connotations when there are low-income families involved. There were a few times when my lunch money on my school account would run out before I could remind my mom to refill it. When this happened in elementary school, there was this one really sweet lunch lady that would sometimes just let me have the meal anyway. Otherwise, the only options you could have was a plate of fruits and vegetables or some of the containers of sliced bread and little cups of peanut butter and jelly to make your own sandwich. Definitely not the worst options in the world, at least there was still something to eat. In middle and high school though, there was definitely a bit of a difference when I ran out of lunch money. There were a few times when I wasn't allowed to walk away from the lunch line with any food at all because I didn't have money to pay for it. And while I'm sure being a little hungry for the last half of the day didn't stunt my growth entirely, for low-income families this wasn't a sometimes occurrence but one that potentially happened every school day and could have a much bigger impact. There are programs within certain states and districts that offer reduced cost or completely free lunches for children that can't afford it otherwise. But this sometimes limits the amount of food a child is allowed to buy based on the amount of funding they receive to allocate per free lunch. A less satisfied kid is better than a hungry one, but you'd think there'd be a better, more effective option by this point. As for changes made to school lunch standards in recent years, government administration has scaled back some of the guidelines that Obamafication required out of school lunches. Depending on a school's local agriculture and access to labor, among other things, some schools have a hard time meeting a requirement to serve only whole grains or large amounts of fruits and vegetables, so these are among the rules that have been lessened. Still no word on the regulation of mystery meat, though. Despite there being a lot of issues that continue on to this day in American school cafeterias, there's still some nostalgia from older generations that miss that specific taste of their favorite school lunch item. Copycat recipes are pretty easy to find across the internet, with rectangle cafeteria pizza being a popular one, though there are others for things like cakes and cookies too. And if you're wondering why so many people can relate to a specific taste of cafeteria food that spans across 50 states, it's because there are pretty much three main companies that reign over the contracted food industry and provide to most of the schools in America. Despite eating this food that comes pre-made and maybe a little soggy or old, I definitely have mostly positive memories of my school lunches too. Even if for the last few years of my schooling, they usually consisted of Little Caesar's hot and ready pizza that was often neither hot nor ready, and always had little holes throughout it for whatever reason. But school lunch is a bigger issue than just removing vending machines and contracted junk food because, as this Washington Post article puts it, it's a complex juggling act with federal regulations, budget realities, crunched lunch schedules, aging kitchens, and cultural sensitivities to say nothing of picky eaters. I think the school lunch staff definitely deserve an apology for always being portrayed as mean and nasty and their food no better, when there really is a lot more going on behind the scenes of their lunchrooms than parents and politicians can see on the surface. And with studies showing that healthy, quality school lunches help improve focus, absences, test scores, and learning, among other things, there's a lot on the line. So is there a magic fix-all government regulation that could make sure no kid ever goes hungry, overeats, or develops a sugar addiction in schools all at the same time? Not right now, at least, but with so much attention and effort still being poured into the topic, I'd like to think, hopefully, we're at least on the right track.